So welcome to the uh, Full Self-Driving Boot Camp. Um, the course was developed actually by myself, Ken, Ken Levine, who's uh, another founder of the club, and Jeff Cadman, who's the VP of the Test Owners Club of Maryland, who's actually with us tonight too. Okay, so kind of an outline of what we're going to cover tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the history of full self-driving with Tesla. Uh, we're going to talk about how it works. Um, we're going to go over the autopilot and the uh, full self-driving features. We're going to talk about limitations on the product that's out there. Um, and then we'll kind of talk a bit about where we think the product is going uh, down the road here a bit. Okay, so let's start out with the history of autopilot. Okay, so SAE um, International, which is kind of a standards organization, has come up with what they consider to be five levels of self-driving. Um, level zero, one, and two, which are all considered driver support features. And then we've got levels three through five, which are considered automated driving features. If we were gonna rate uh, Tesla's current level, um, most of us would probably say they're in around the level two range given the product that we're working with today. Um, we're hoping that level three um, is the next iteration of this. Um, and that's something that Jeff is actually testing now and he's gonna talk about a little later. Um, but while that will still require some intervention on your part, um, it starts to minimize that. So when we look at level zero, one and two, we view those no different in my mind than how we look at cruise control. You would never put cruise control on in a vehicle um, and, and not pay attention to what's going on. So the product that we have today is exactly that. It's, it's a driver assist package that takes some of the driving load off of us, but it certainly does not make our cars autonomous. So pre-autopilot 2012, basically to 2014, uh, Tesla vehicles had none of these functions. Nothing was automated. They didn't even have adaptive cruise control, no active safety features at all. Uh, my first Tesla was a 2013 Model S and it was basically, aside from it being electric, it didn't do anything really particularly special as opposed to any other car on the road. In two, September of 2014, Tesla introduced AP1. Um, now Autopilot 1, was basically designed for highway use. Um, single front facing camera, um, integrated a Bosch radar um, and 12 sonar sensors with about a 16 foot range. Now Tesla did not have their own product at that time. So what they used was the Mobileye Q3 processor. And the Mobileye product was actually pretty slick. Um, it had traffic aware cruise control, it had auto steer. Um, it was able to do automatic lane changes and it read speed limit signs. So for that first iteration for AP1, people who have AP1 cars were always really pretty happy with the way the product operated. Uh, my second Tesla was a 2015 Model S. I had AP1 in it and it was bulletproof. If I was on a highway, I had no problem letting the car drive. Um, and for the most part, the intervention for me was, was minimal. Um, local roads was a different story. That was kind of, uh, if I was going to do that, I was going to stay really aware of what was going on around me. But somewhere along the way, there was a, a parting of the ways, a disagreement between Tesla and Mobileye. Um, some people say it was just over money. Mobileye was looking for too much um, for their product. Te Tesla and Elon decided, well, the heck with that. We can go develop our own autopilot program. Um, and that's when Tesla decided to branch off on its own. So in October 2016, Tesla introduced AP2. Now, AP2 was the first in-house homegrown product that Tesla ever put in the car. Um, it consisted of uh, eight cameras, uh, three front-facing, two front-facing camera, side front-facing cameras, two side rear-facing cameras, and one rear-facing camera. Now, the sensors in the car, they moved to the Bosch radar, um, 525 feet of range, and they upped it to 12 sonar sensors, which were now upgraded to 26 feet of range. So they're getting a better picture, basically, of, of what's around the car. Uh, the initial computer that was in the car, it had one NVIDIA 
system on the chip processor and one NVIDIA Pascal GPU, graphic processing unit. Um, it was basically capable of processing 110 frames per second. There was no auto lane change in this product and there were no speed limit sign recognition capabilities. It just happened to be that Mobileye had the patent on how to read a speed limit sign and Tesla couldn't get around that patent for quite a while. Again, stop me at any point, you know, throw it in the chat if you guys have a question. I have no problem on answering them. I know this is pretty dry, this stuff. So this is mostly historical. Nobody really cares about this. <laughs> but, but anyway, AP 2.5, the next iteration, came out in August 2017. Same eight cameras, but upgraded to red, black, and blue color channels. Uh, they changed the sensors to a continental radar, which gave them a little more range. Um, and they basically stuck with the same 12 sonar cameras. They upgraded to two NVIDIA processors, um, in addition to the one NVIDIA, NVIDIA graphic processing unit. But it still remained at 110 frames per second of processing capability. They also added the dash cam features, sentry mode, but you still had no speed limit sign recognition um, because Mobileye would not uh, release the patent. So that brings us to the present. So in March of 2019, AP3 was introduced, also known as FSD. Again, eight cameras covering all angles. Uh, the sensors, they got the continental radar with a little additional range um, and the same 12 sonar sensors. The big change in this product was the full self-driving computer that was designed specifically in-house by Tesla. Um, it uses two Tesla chips, um, each 64-bit ARM cores, if you care about the, the details, two neural networks, two GPOs, GPUs rather. Um, this was basically the computer that Tesla figured out they needed if they were ever going to be able to achieve full self-driving. And they produced that chip in Austin, Texas. It's based on Samsung's uh, process technology. Um, and to really sum all this up, you've got between the two chips, the, the neural processing units, you're looking at the capability of 73.7 trillion operations per second of peak performance. This is Tesla recognizing what it really takes to be able to drive a car. So when we look at autopilot and self-driving, this is kind of how the features break down. Okay, so the initial autopilot one had these four features in it. TAC, auto steer, auto lane change, and speed limit sign recognition. Enhanced autopilot, which Tesla sold for a brief period of time, actually contained those three items from AP1 and added in auto lane change, navigate on autopilot, summon, and auto park. All became part of enhanced autopilot. Um, and that was sold briefly in September of 2020. Uh, that was the last time they sold it. Finally, the full self-driving adds in stoplight, stop sign recognition, and navigate on autopilot on city streets. That's the, the, the piece that we're waiting for right now. So just a general overview of, of what the world looks like to our cars. These are the, are the cameras, the radar, and the sensors um, create this level um, of observation. This is kind of what our vehicles look like, look at um, and how they see a 360 degree view around the vehicle. Okay. I am, <laughs> last time we played this, we, we crashed, remember? <laughs> so keep your fingers crossed. We're going to try and play a video for you. And what this video does is actually show you the raw data that the full self-driving computer is looking at when it's engaged. Um, so keep your fingers crossed. If we, if we crash everybody, you have your links, <laughs> so just could dial back in, in, in here. If I disappear or something, though, I may not since Jeff's the co-host, so I may crash and maybe you'll still be here, but if something happens, don't panic. We'll be right back, <laughs> but I'd like to show it to you because it's pretty cool. That's smooth.
Yep, this is everything that the car is looking at while, while we're driving. All the things that it needs to be aware of. And look at the list of stuff on the left and the right there as it, as it identifies these things. Cool. It worked and I didn't crash. I'm still here. Okay. So that gives you some perspective of how many things the car has got to process in order to be able to perform full self-driving functions. And speaking of full self-driving functions, let's talk about how we operate it. Um, first of all, if you're going to use autopilot, please, please, please read the manual. We know that, you know, it's mostly guys on here tonight with a couple of exceptions and guys don't read manuals. We know that, but, but I'm telling you that, uh, this is a computer on wheels and you're driving the vehicle, take, take a couple of minutes to go through the manual and understand what's going on. Um, and it will absolutely make your life easier. So we need to put that caveat right up front. So to use autopilot, uh, first of all, traffic aware cruise control is the first step. A single down swipe on your gear on your gear shift engages tack only. If you swipe down twice on your gear shift, it engages auto steer. Now, auto steer can never be engaged without tack, but tack can be engaged without auto steer. If that makes sense. To manually cancel that, you're going to move your lever up or step on the brake pedal. Um, in the model S and the X, um, you move the autopilot lever away from you. Um, the other thing to keep in mind here is that uh, if you disengage auto steer, and, and this happens a lot, where you, you know, you're getting some kind of uh, um, warning, um, to you know, move the steering wheel and you move a little too much and you disengage auto steer, tack will stay on unless you disengage it. So always keep that in mind that your cruise control stays on even if you've manually disengaged auto steer by turning on the wheel. Okay, so with FSD, navigate on autopilot. Right now is only available when you're navigating to a destination and you're on a limited access highway. Uh, NOA will automatically take you off interchanges to, to merging highways and will take you down off exit ramps. Um, and it does a pretty good job of doing that. Um, you, with, with, with this feature, you also have auto lane change. Now auto lane change, again, you can initiate with a turn lever and, and conf which is a confirmation or what'll happen is the car will suggest a lane change. And when it does that, the lane next to you gets highlighted and you can initiate that lane change either with your directional signal or by tapping down on the gear shift stalk. Either one will execute an auto lane change. Now in the settings under autopilot, you have the option of the car making those lane changes with or without your confirmation. My suggestion as a longtime user of this, confirm those lane changes. Don't let the car make those lane changes on its own. Um, it's just not ready to do that yet. <laughs> and, uh, and if you look in there, you'll see different levels of aggression for those lane changes, uh, one of which is Mad Max. Um, I would suggest you don't use Mad Max for your lane changes either if you decide to do that. But again, what, what, whenever we're, we're using this product, we have to remember that we're testing it for the most part and we have to use a, an extreme amount of caution and always be aware that the ultimate responsibility for driving a car is us, not the software. Okay, uh, along with FSD, you also get auto park. So if your car sees a parking spot, you're gonna get a, that gray icon that pops up next to the vehicle. And to use auto park, you're gonna press on the brake, shift your, your gear selector into reverse, keeping your foot on the brake. And then you'll see a start auto park will appear in blue text on the touch screen. When you hit that feature, then release the brake and the steering and the car should park itself. If you're not happy with what the car is doing at any time, you can override it by taking control of the steering wheel or the brake pedal. 
and you'll take back control of the car. Now, people will tell you it's sometimes hard to get this to come up on the screen. You have to be going below 15 miles an hour if you're looking at a parallel parking spot and below 10 miles an hour for a perpendicular spot. Um, the car is very finicky about that. If you're doing 16, it's not going to find it. Um, so you literally have to be below that if you're trying to get the car to park. So any questions on auto park? Cool. All right, let's talk about summon. All right, so summon can be activated and basically there's two levels of summon. We, we call it summon and smart summon. Basic summon is basically what we're looking at in that top screen where we can move the car forward and backwards in a straight line. It's basically forward and reverse. Um, I find it's handy, you know, think about the times you're in the uh, mall parking lot and it's been pouring rain and is the only spot that's open has a big puddle of water in it. So you can line your car up, get out of the car, hit summon, hit forward, the car will park itself in the puddle and you don't have to walk through the water. And when you get back to the car, you do the opposite, put it in reverse, let the car back out for you. So that's simple summon, very easy to use and pretty reliable to do what it needs to do. Um, in the Model 3 and the Y, it has to be activated from the app in the S and the X, you can use your key fob. Uh, to activate someone in the S and the X, you hold the roof of your key fob for like two seconds, the car will beep and the mirrors will fold. And then you can press the frunk to go forward and the trunk to go backwards. Smart summon on the other hand, um, is supposed to be able to have your car execute its way through a parking lot to come see you. Uh, let's see here. No, not for, yeah, thank you. Um, and let's see if, if you buy a key fob for three, that's, that's a really good question. Yeah. But I think Jeff's right. I don't believe that it will work with the three and the Y. Good question though, Luke. And Jeff, thanks for being on the chat, man. You're on the ball. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so Smart Summon supposedly lets us navigate our vehicles through a parking lot. So assuming that you were in a mall standing, in, in, again, it's that same rainy day, and you're standing at the mall entrance and you want your car to come pick you up. You're supposed to be able to open your app, point on your location, and tell the car to come to me. Now, I personally don't have the guts to do that, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, I, what I would suggest you do, and I've done this a couple of times, is go to an empty parking lot sometime and play with it. Put the car in a parking spot, use Smart Summon, walk away, try and get the car to navigate to you and see how, how reliable it is. And honestly, to tell you the truth, I haven't tried in a while and it may have improved. Hey, John, I, I, I've used it quite a bit, and I find where it has better connectivity, it seems to do better. Uh, but I also find a lot of times it turns like the opposite direction than a normal person would turn in, in a parking lot. So it'd like go around the parking lot. They must have different rules in California or something. And then the other thing that I like to do is like uh, if you're waiting on the, on the side of the road, you know, on the other side, like say you're in front of a giant or something, instead of pulling up next to you, it just right goes right across the lane and blocks all the other traffic and stops. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it's it, definitely you want to do it in a place that's not a, has a lot of traffic, foot traffic or, or driving traffic. Uh, and I try to always have it come off to the side somewhere, but it typically stops right in the middle of, of a lane and blocks everybody else. So just be aware of that, that you might piss people off. Yeah. Uh, but it's a lot of fun in a, in a you know, a parking lot that's less, more secluded, less people. Uh, people get really impressed with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. Hopefully it'll get there someday. Yeah, um, we would expect that. And, uh, you know, one of the events that we've actually been talking about for the club, some, some people want to have, a, 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 have an event with a, summon, a smart summon race. <laughs> to see whose car actually gets to them first. <laughs> I, I have taken it where have it follow me down a, a, a driveway before along like a, you know, a 50 foot or hundred foot driveway area. I've, I've walked ahead of it and had it keep following me and it did. So that was pretty cool. So that's out there. We think that's going to improve 
um, constantly. And, uh, and uh, so we'll look forward to that. But again, that's included in the full self-driving package. Okay. Also included in the full self-driving package is traf like, traffic light and stop sign control. Um, and I find this actually works fairly well. Um, the car will recognize the stop sign, will come to a stop. It waits for you to tap the gear, the gear stalk before it will go through the stop sign. So right now it's not using that, on the version that we have, it's not intelligent enough where it's willing to decide whether there are cars coming on the cross street. So you have to make that decision. Um, the way that the traffic light recognition works is the car will by default stop at all traffic lights, whether they're green or red, unless you tell it to keep going or unless there's a lead car in front of you. So if you're approaching a traffic light and, it, and it's green and there's a car in front of you, it will follow that car through the traffic light. If there's no vehicle in front of you, it's gonna ask you to confirm by pr pressing down the gear stalk, it's gonna ask you to confirm that you want it to proceed through the light. Again, based on the level of uh, intelligence that the cars are at right now, all of these are pretty good safety precautions. Um, and again, as we keep doing this, Tesla is gathering data and learning more and more about how the cars should be handling themselves at intersections. Your, your accelerator pedal will uh, acknowledge a green light too. Yes, that's true. Yeah, if there's a green light, you can tap the accelerator too. And, and actually, you can, tap, you can tap the accelerator coming out of a stop sign also. And it'll also now tell you if there's a green light, it'll make a beep for you, letting you know, hey, light just turned green. Okay, hang on, Spencer. Let me see this. Is there a way to let Tesla know what it thinks is a stoplight isn't one? Why don't you come off mute, Spencer? You obviously have something in mind there. Yeah, what I've got a couple instances around the Harrisburg area where they've got flashing, uh, four flashing yellow lights on a sign that says curve coming up or something and it slows down. I've even had it when they have the, in an overhead electrical wire where they've got the red balls on it to tell the helicopter don't run into it. It thinks it's a stoplight. Is there any way to let them know that that's wrong? <laughs> yeah, all you, all you need to do there is hit your microphone button and say bug report. Oh, okay. And uh, it'll, if you want, you can, uh, you can actually, you know, make us a, a short statement to send with that. Okay. But, but you don't even have to, because what it'll do is it takes a snapshot of everything your car is seeing at that moment and captures it and sends it to Tesla. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. And by the way, that bug report feature is also really good um, if, you, if, um, if you've got any kind of issue going on with the car. If there's anything going on and you're going to be making a service appointment for it, you got error messages, say bug report. Note the time that you made the bug report. And when you uh, bring it in for service, tell them I made a bug report at this time. And they, they would be able to then look up and see exactly what the car was doing at the moment that you you had whatever issue you encountered. Um, but keep in mind that bug report, as a rule, unless, unless you're using it for service the way I just described, Tesla doesn't sit there looking at those bug reports um, saying that, oh, we got to call this guy and solve this problem. Um, basically, the, they get accumulated. They look for patterns of common errors, but they're not going to intervene directly in a problem in your vehicle just because you say bug report. So just be aware of that. Don't consider that like making a service call. <laughs> yeah, I, you've used it a lot for that, I bet. <laughs> Yep. Um, it stopped at a red light even after authorized to proceed. Well, it, uh, that's a good one, John. Um, why would you want it to proceed through a red light? <laughs> it's the first question I would ask, but um, um, having never tried to do that. Uh, uh, the light turned red after I had authorized it when it was like four or 500 feet away. And oh, yeah. Well, yeah. It stopped. If it's got time to stop, it's going to stop. Absolutely. Right. So that's so that's why. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That makes perfect sense then. Yep. And that's what you'd want it to do, actually. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the standard safety features that also come with FSD. And actually, these come with every Tesla vehicle. Um, automatic emergency braking engages the car's brakes when it believes it's about to collide. Uh, remember that this initiates the braking process. It doesn't necessarily bring your car to a stop. All it's going to do is start, it, it, what, the purpose of this really is to reduce your, re, your reaction time. So that when there's an emergency situation and automatic emergency braking engages, when you go to hit your brake, you're going to find the pedals about halfway down already. Um, because Tesla's already started the braking process, basically, uh, to help improve your response to that. But like everything else, you are still ultimately responsible for stopping your vehicle. Don't sit there and say, you know, after you hit something in front of you, say, why didn't the car stop me? Uh, that's it's always your responsibility to make sure that that happens. Um, forward collision warning looks for obstacles in front of the vehicle. It's going to alert you um, in, in hopes that you're going to react so the car doesn't have to. Um, it can be set to warn you at different levels, early, medium, or late. It really depends on how conservative you want to be in your driving habits. Um, and finally, obstacle aware acceleration. Um, we think that this was a reaction to the quote, sudden unintended acceleration stories that were coming around, which by the way, after the NTSB investigated, none of them were found to be accurate. Basically they were driver error. Someone hit the go pedal when they thought they hit the brake. Um, yeah, um, on the forward collision warning, I leave mine on medium, John. I mean, that's, I, I, I'm kind of a middle of the road kind of guy. Yeah, I was gonna come off mute and say, so when that feature became available, I turned it on, uh, you know, the paranoid level and driving through the neighborhood, there's cars parallel parked and, you know, you get that red, really loud beep, 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 beep. And, you know, your significant other freaks out when they hear that. You turn that down a little bit. <laughs> yep. That's when you need Joe mode. <laughs> um. So yeah, so medium seems to, to be the, the, the go-to spot on that, John. Um, obstacle aware acceleration, again, as I was saying, um, they found all of those, quote, unintended accelerations happened because of driver error, a driver thinking they were in reverse, hit the go pedal, and were not in reverse and ended up you know, driving through a garage door or something stupid like that. Um, what this is supposed to do is if you're lurching forward and, this, and you have an obstruction, it's supposed to slow the, your acceleration down. Again, it will not stop your car. You're going to hit whatever you're going to hit if you don't hit the brake. But if, you're not, if you jumped on that go pedal, it's not going to leap off the line with acceleration. It's going to accelerate slowly because it's aware that something's in front of you. Okay, side collision warning. And again, be aware, whenever you see the word warning. Yes, thank you, Jeff, that's hey, right. Hey, it's just me chatting, don't. <laughs> no, 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 that's good. No, thank you for doing that, you're right. Well, I just I just listened to a podcast um, today and a guy called in saying, yeah, I was picking my kid up from school and I backed up into a car that was behind me that I didn't see in the uh, in the camera and, and the car just did it. <laughs> and he was like, Tesla should make this obstacle detection forward and back because it cost me two grand in repair to whatever <laughs> or something that was behind them. <laughs> um, yep. Anyway, so when we see these features on here, side collision warning. A warning doesn't mean that your vehicle is going to take any active measures to avoid something. It's just going to let you know that you've got a problem. And it's up to you to be aware of what the problem is and take corrective action. So that's what the side collision warning does. Blind spot monitoring, as most Tesla drivers will tell you, um, it really needs to be improved in our cars. I mean, you can buy a, a Honda Civic today and have blind spot monitoring in, in the side view mirror with a red flashing light to let you know that there's a car there. When we're driving our cars, the only place we see uh, a blind spot warning is on our touch screen. So if you're making a left, a left lane change, the last place you're looking is down to the right at, at your screen to do that. 
you're looking outside to the left in your mirror. So for all intents and purposes, you don't get a warning. So the thing to do is keep an eye on your touch screen or turn your head. I mean, of course, right now, my, in my opinion, our blind spot monitoring leaves a lot to be desired. Anything you want to add to that, Jeff? No, okay. Uh, nodding in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, feel free. I mean, don't, you know, pop in anytime you like, man. <laughs> um, okay, lane departure avoidance. Now, in this particular case, because it's lane departure avoidance, the car will take corrective action even when auto steer is inactive. So if you start to drift out of your lane, uh, lane departure avoidance will nudge the car back into the lane. Um, now you can also configure this as a warning chime or turned off if you don't like the nudge at all. That's entirely up to you. Um, personally, I keep mine turned off because on some of the back roads I drive, I cross the yellow line periodically and I don't need the car you know, nudging me back over when I don't want to be. Um, but it, it all goes with your driving style and your personal preference. And that's why it's great that it's an option for you to set in, 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 your, in your screen. Now, emergency lane de departure avoidance is a much more extreme version of this. And this is on every time you turn your car on. If you want this off, you have to turn your car on, physically go in the, in the menu, turn it off. And for that drive only, it will remain off. As soon as you turn your car off and on again, it comes back on. Um, so this is really a, a situation where you you fall asleep at the wheel, the car's leaving its lane, there's risk of a collision or other vehicles around, the, the car's going to rapidly take over and put you back in your lane. Okay, any questions about any of this? Okay, so let's talk about limitations, which we've kind of been talking about pretty much all along. Okay, because there are limitations uh, with the current state of autopilot. Um, first, the obvious, it's not full self-driving. I don't care what Tesla says, they can call it anything they want. Um, it's a hardware and software package that should be capable of achieving SAE level five, but it's certainly not there yet. We are the beta testers, um, though Jeff is actually the real beta beta tester. Um, and he'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, so there are a number of limitations that complicate this journey to level five. First of all, autopilot requires visibility. Cameras and sensors have to be clean, unobstructed. Bad weather decreases visibility. All these can affect autopilot features or when you're driving, it might just affect, affect navigate on autopilot, which seems to be the more common um, interference. Um, if you look at this car, this image right here, this car was on NOA, but navigate on autopilot's now unavailable because of poor weather being detected. Whatever's blocking the, the vision of the car, it can't use NOA on this highway because of that. Even though autopilot can still engage, it's not, NOA takes a little more um, uh, visibility than the standard autopilot does. So you're gonna get warnings about that. You're going to get either auto lane changes unavailable, NOA currently unavailable, uh, the left door pillar camera blocked or blinded. That, that's the real common one. Um, the, the, the ones on the outside, you can see all the time. And they happen for a number of reasons. One, sunlight can be blinding. You may be driving on a perfectly sunny day down a highway and the sun's off to your left, not bothering you, but guess what? It's blinding your side camera. So when that happens, <laughs> autopilot's not going to be able to determine whether they can make a lane change. So it's going to limit its, its ability. So anything that affects visibility is going to impair those functions. And this is the kind of message you get for a sun like that. In the winter time, when the sun is lower in the sky, I find I get this more often. In the summertime, not quite as much. <clears throat> so obvious troubleshooting steps, wait, it could go away. Obviously, if it's caused by the sun, it's going to go away when you change your direction of travel. Um, you, can, you can try and make sure that uh, your side pillars are clean. Um, if the problem persists, it could be a service issue. One of the things that happens to the cameras all the time, and you always hear about this, is condensation. Um, 
this normally occurs, especially in the time of year where we've got big temperature changes. Um, our camera housings are not hermetically sealed. And I've spoken with Tesla about this, and this is on purpose. They felt that by not hermetically sealing them, they'd be able to breathe so they, they can clear the condensation issues out of there. If they were sealed and you got condensation in there, it would never clear. Um, so the idea is that it's gonna, it's gonna clear as you're driving, air, you're gonna get some airflow through there. Um, if, this, if you get direct sunlight on it, usually that will get rid of the fogging also, um, but these things happen. Now, if it persists and, and you can't get it to go away, again, you may have a service call there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> here in PA and Maryland, um, slush and snow buildup are a biggie. Um, the front radar requires our, our bumpers to be clear. And anybody that's driven a Tesla in the snow knows that unlike an ice car, um, our hoods don't get warm. <laughs> so when we get precipitation on there, it stays on there. Um, one of the things that we found uh, a number of, you, of uh, club members have been using is uh, the Rust-Oleum never wet, but only the top coat. It goes on, it gets a little hazy, but it prevents any uh, snow or ice from building up on, on the front bumper. Um, do not ever use the base coat that doesn't come off. <laughs> so it's all about using the top coat. It'll go on, it's on there temporarily and it, it'll wipe off when you're done. Okay, another famous piece of the action here is phantom braking. And anybody that has FSD and uses it has experienced this. Um, there are still a couple of things that our cars can't quite figure out. The first is the shadow, <clears throat> okay? In this particular picture, th there's two items in this picture that I know when if I'm driving are gonna cause phantom braking for me. <clears throat> the first is the shadow coming across the road over here. And the second is gonna be that overpass because when we approach an overpass and the overpass is down the bottom of an incline, so we're coming from an elevated location, um, right now, the car views that overpass as being on the same level as we are. And you can easily get phantom braking around overpasses because of that, because the car can't figure out, uh, it kind of gets tricked, not knowing that the overpass is above us. Um, being aware of those situations helps you um, deal with them a little better. When I'm, on, when I'm driving on a highway, I've gotten in the habit uh, especially if I'm on a road like this with, with lots of overpasses and stuff going on, um, I just keep my foot around the go pedal. If, if I see phantom braking you know, start to happen, I can jam the go pedal down quick enough to really prevent anything from you know, occurring as in a car behind me going nuts because I slammed on the brakes. So being aware of it and understanding the situations where it can occur can help you do that. Yeah, this was a little trip they did uh, in Israel um, where they actually were, they literally flashed a sign next to, next to the Tesla and look what the Tesla sees. It sees a stop sign. So, and they only flashed that sign for a split second, but it kind of messed things up. So it's just a, kind of a way of letting us know that our cars have a long way to go yet. They've got a lot to learn. Okay, so where are we going? I think Jeff is the perfect guy to talk about that. I sm smirked a little bit when um, John had the uh, computer upgrade uh, slide on and say, you know, like, oh, they Tesla added two chips and, um, you know, it's everything that's needed for full self-driving. And I smirked because I've been using it for uh, a few months now and uh, there's still some room for improvement. So whether it's hardware or some software improvements, they're, they're working on it. They're working hard. Uh, yeah. So I, yeah. What's really on this, on this slide is just um, to, to give you an idea of how difficult it is. Um, when, when you look at it, you say, you know, the car's got to know the difference between a dog running on the road and a plastic bag floating on the road. They, they require different responses from the vehicle. The computer needs to remember everything that was in the last frame while processing the new frame and looking at the current frame and, and trying to see ahead. So it's a sequence of, of continuous events. Um, it's not a snapshot in time. And because of that, it's a very complicated process. 
Um, yeah. so and, and humans, we're really good at that, apparently. Uh, the computer, like you can, you can almost feel it thinking and deciding, you know, like, is this something I need to be afraid of? Um, we, I, I've done some research, uh, watching YouTube videos of, uh, Tesla folks and, and others, uh, since I've been beta testing and it's a hard problem to solve. Um, they're doing a combination of things like Tesla is hiring labelers, um, where they literally will look at the video frames that are coming from our cars. And, um, you know, I think we had some examples, you know, like the car thinks it sees a stop sign, it hits the brakes, but it's really not a stop sign. It's, it's a sign that says, you know, stop, except if you're turning right or, you know, some condition underneath. And there's humans that are getting these images, just like the, the captures that captures that we answer when we're logging into websites. Um, they're doing that for the data that's coming from our cars. Um, going forward, um, you know, I think one thing that Tesla is taking out of the software is uh, they're, they're moving to a pure vision approach where it uses, right now it's using, I think, um, four of the forward facing cameras. Well, so the, the two on the pillars, the, um, the ones on the, the bumpers and the, the front facing camera, they're gonna bring all those together and do a pure vision and rely less on some of the sonar, which is looking for curbs. Curbs they've sort of mapped and you know, we, can, we can get to that stuff. And that's where uh, we may, I think, my opinion, it's like we may need some better hardware to process that stuff. Um, and so what, yeah, what, what John's talking about, and thanks for advancing the slide, is the difference, the thing that, that I've got that's different than uh, most of the cars out there is I can activate uh, autopilot basically once I exit my driveway, uh, running through neighborhoods, cars parked on both sides of the streets. It's using the cameras and identifying all the objects around it. Um, you do or don't need to put a destination in. Works, I've noticed it works a bit better if you do program a destination in. Otherwise, it's the computer is doing this weird prediction based, you know, like, hey, nine times out of 10, when you take this route, you turn left or right, or, you know, the driver that passed you before does that stuff. Um, so you end up with weird situations like I have a favorite way getting back into my neighborhood. That is, you know, that my wife says, you know, ah, it's just a pain. You have to, you know, turn left and, uh, and avoid traffic lights and stuff. And the car always wants to turn right, which is the opposite way of getting to my house. And I'm going to turn left. So there's, there's things like that. Still drives like a computer. Um, is this where we get to the video? So, so yeah. this is... Next slide, I think. <laughs> this is all right. So these are these are images that I took. Um, so uh, a couple months ago, I, I put a post out there on Facebook, you know, saying, you know, what are challenges that you've seen? So somebody in our in our um, Facebook group in Maryland said, I take this route all the time. It's the the map image in the middle. Um, autopilot always loses it on uh, step two. So this is a state highway. Uh, you know, it's a uh, two is a flashing yellow light, I think. You can go straight, but most of the time, everybody just kind of bears to the left, that uh, southern turn. And so I engaged basically manually on the map when you cross underneath 70, which is an interstate. And um, you want to go ahead and advance to the video and sure. see the thing in action? All right, here we go. Once again, keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> hmm. Is this an embedded video? Oh, there it goes. There it goes. Yeah, I knew there was a dark spot at the beginning. <laughs> That's my awesome video editing. <laughs> 
I like your cameraman with you too. Yeah. He actually got good video close up for the other stuff, but putting it all together, this one works pretty well. Um, so hard to tell in this video, but right there, the car really slowed down. And what I'm do, I reached to touch the screen. Uh, somebody asked a question about like, can you do a bug report? For the beta testers, there's a little tiny, and it's really tiny, camera icon on the screen. And it basically takes a snapshot and sends it to Tesla. Um, the car was passing through an intersection. It was a flashing yellow light. And it really just jammed on the brakes. Um, so going from about 45 to 30 in a short amount of time. So on the screen, you can see the blue autopilot wheels engaged. Um, we're in that straight section and we're coming up to that flashing yellow. So we're kind of cresting a hill here. You can't, because the mirror's in the way, you can't see the yellow light that's flashing ahead. And the turn signal's already on. You can see the green flash on the image, on the screen indicator. I'm just resting my hand on the wheel. The car made the turn. And we're continuing on the route. That's very really cool. <laughs> I, I, I posted this video in our Facebook group. Yeah, I'm giving a thumbs up like the car understands that and gets encouragement, <laughs> almost like patting the dog. Uh, so the last part, and this is where my, my cameraman, who's uh, getting punchy here, like his, his job is done. There's another interesting turn you'll see coming up, we, we go through like a, a little train trestle and we're going through a small town. Uh, this was done in January, February. So the, the white stuff on the road is um, some, some salt brine. So car's still driving. We kind of go through this train trestle. Here's a little bit of a blind turn and you'll see there's an option to go straight the car sees the, the yellow arrows, continues on the route. I don't have a destination programmed here, and we're done. <laughs> yeah, that was great. And, and you weren't driving, right? I mean, you were just resting your hand on the wheel. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so so I, I don't have good video of this, but um, I did do a recent drive so like I said, this is back in January, February timeframe, got an update and um, I did a, a drive through Virginia, similar roads. And there were two notable instances. So this is where, you know, this is beta software. We're constantly in control. The car still does stupid things. Um, four way stop and it's a busy intersection. So cars are coming, you know, there's a car at each stop sign. The car to my left didn't pause at all. Came to a stop, did a California roll, kept on going through. I'm at the stop sign. I got there before him. The car starts going. I had to jam on the brakes because it thinks, you know, hey, I got this intersection. But the guy, you know, was cutting through the intersection. Fast forward through the through the drive, um, I had a destination programmed in. It's a shopping center all along a, a main road, and the car driving like a computer was very literal. I made a right turn onto the main road, and the entrance to the shopping center is an immediate left. There's a line of cars at a traffic light. Um, the car acted like Oh, it saw some sort of a gap between the cars and I'm going to go for it and started to turn left right in front of somebody who was starting to move ahead for a traffic light. And it's an immediate like grab the wheel, disengage, hit the brakes. And what happens with the beta software is um, when whenever you disengage, jerk the wheel, hit the brake, turn off the autopilot, it logs data points. And when you get into a Wi-Fi signal, so like when I get back home, the car's connected to Wi-Fi, it'll send all that data back up and they're scrutinizing the 
you know the the data that we're sending so that's why even for you know just like errands around town i try and engage use the software um sending more data reinforcing neural networks uh whatever that means to be honest <laughs> um but i think every little bit helps uh so time will tell uh, any questions? I see Vic asked a question. I have not gotten any recent updates. Um, I don't know if I said it in the, this meeting, but so Elon has uh, tweeted out that they're doing a large, um, calling it like a, an infrastructure change. They're basically focusing uh, more on cameras and they're fusing a lot of that data. Uh, so it's I think, put it best, I, I, I watched like a, an investor video um, with uh, a scientist who studies neural networks and he made an analogy like in the, the smart summon stuff, you use it in the parking lot and the way it starts is it takes a picture of its surroundings. It sees the spot you're in, maybe a curb and a planter that are within proximity to the car and it knows that it needs to pick you up and you're probably like 50 yards away. So what it does with those pictures is plots a course and does a bunch of math to, to make the, the route to you. Um, and you can sort of, if you've tried it out in the parking lot, you can see, you can see that happening. Um, what he did in the, in the talk was do, uh, somebody did a test and plotted out the math versus what he called ground truth, which was photographs and overhead maps of the route that a human driver would take. And they were completely different. The, the car doing the, uh, doing the math to get to you could only think two or three steps ahead. Um, the hypothesis is that when we start using eight cameras all around the car, and hardware that can um, process it in near real time, it will be just like we process with our eyes. You can see, you move ahead, you, you get closer. It's, um, you know, it's one of these training things. It's like you can see just as far as the fog is it, it ahead of you. And then as you get into the fog, you can see better. So that's what we're thinking is coming in the next update, this big version nine update that um, it's the carrot that uh, we're waiting on. And we think it's in a couple of weeks. So we'll see. Very cool. Um, yeah, Spencer put a Spencer's question. I just got a question. What's that? Had errors in the past, they fixed. So it's hard to say. Um, there are some routes that I take regularly and I know on a particular road, it's a two lane, it's four lanes, two in each direction. There's a section where, and I, I usually stay in the right lane. I don't need to turn, but I'm not gonna be in, in the hog in the left lane. The car, for whatever reason, wants to constantly get in that left lane. Um, and for the most part, it's probably right. There are people that are slowing down and they're, going to the post office or going to the shopping center. And it's less annoying to be in the left lane, but I, the turn signal is constantly turning on. So basically when you're using the beta software, um, it's like using Navigate on Autopilot, even if you don't have it engaged. So it's firing off turn signals, whether you want it to or not. The cars behind you think this guy doesn't know where he's going because you know can't decide, I'm going left, I'm going right. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm constantly canceling turn signals. And a lot of times I just throw my hands up and go ahead. You want to be in the left lane, get in the left lane. It hasn't changed. I, I think that is attributable to like a labeling or a mapping issue, which I like was talking about before. Another inter interesting case is I have a, like a roundabout in our neighborhood real close to the house. Um, it was installed recently. The car knows it's there. Um, it, it didn't 
navigate it very well when I first got this back in late December. It's better now, um, but coming from different directions, like it'll do a kind of a kamikaze run and think like, oh, I can totally get around this thing at 25 miles an hour. And it's, it's a really narrow, tight <laughs> circle. Um, so it'll kind of go up on the curbs and freak out your passengers and stuff. Other occasions, and this is where things get screwy, is that a lot of the stuff is time-based and it's time, uh, time of day and more time of day to like John's example where the sun's in a different position. It's rainy, the road is reflecting. Um, it sees things differently. So this roundabout, it's in a neighborhood and there are signs all around it. And there's like five streets that all come into it. So at almost every one of those corners, it says, stop for pedestrians. There's a, it's a, it's a yellow um, triangle. And in the sign, there's a, a red stop sign, which the car sees like, oh, I got to stop. Oh, but there's something that un is underneath it. So you can feel, literally feel the car as you're going around the circle, it jerks and it, oh, I'm stopping. Oh no, I gotta go, I gotta, okay, I can turn. <laughs> and it's just, it's very frustrating. A lot of the times I'm going through it and I'm just sort of pressing the, the accelerator, go, it's okay, it's okay, safe, go, go, go. And the car does the steering, but you have to just sell it. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. So you're training, you're training a, you know, 16 year old driver. <laughs> Question from Robin, or maybe a statement. Kathy Wood from Arc Innovation said Tesla's accumulated a billion miles. No, that's not hyperbole at all. As a matter of fact, if anything, that's probably conservative, I think. Yeah. And, and I think what she's quoting, and, and I've heard the billion number, like from even a couple of years ago, it's all the time that um, we're using autopilot on highways. Um, yeah, I don't think it's directly attributable to what the beta testers are doing right now. Um, speaking of beta testers, the interesting numbers that, that I've heard, and this goes back to the last um, quarterly uh, shareholder report, was when Elon you know, was talking, he says, said something like, we've got a thousand beta testers right now. And so I'm speaking about this because I'm in a group of, we think there's about 50 of us, probably less, that are, that we all signed agreements. They're like limited non-disclosure agreements, but um, we can share information with the public. We can't do streaming video. We can't uh, talk to media and everything, but it's a, it's a very small group. It's folks that I've known as an owner for years. Um, and boy, like our little Twitter chat just lit up when he said there's a thousand people I'm like wow there's that many people and you know it's probably employees um, early access people that have it but then fast forward to you know the Elon's been ramping up his his tweets about full self-driving and they just passed 2,000 and you know the folks that are chatting about it again we're pretty pretty well connected there are people that have gotten emails and said they've been invited to the program but they haven't gotten the call or the the software update and um you know the hypothesis is just they're adding more more employees or more early access folks that are basically you know like locked they can't talk about it anymore. so testing is happening um we're hopeful that we'll get a nice big app update next month cool um other questions for, for jeff or actually any questions on anything uh this is jd i'd just like to comment on the uh, ability to read traffic signs um just be aware if, if you're on autopilot uh, that it may not really see all the speed limit signs or it'll wait till the last moment to slow down. So if there's a speed trap somewhere, it, it, it may still go through that speed trap camera 
because the, the uh, signs are like right before the cameras and it doesn't so slow down, start slowing down until it sees the actual sign. So you gotta be aware of that. I found that especially going down Ocean City and stuff, you see that a lot, but sometimes it just misses the, uh, the speed limit sign and it stays at, you know, it's 45 miles and it drops down to 30 and it'll stay at 45. So kind of I can, I can say with, with confidence that um, at least for the, the beta software, Morrison's joining at the last minute. Thanks, John. Uh, so in our area, and, and this may be specific to um, like with COVID. So I live in just north of Washington, D.C., pretty suburban area. Um, we've had a lot of accidents where pedestrians were, were hit. So the county has lowered the speed limit on, you know, some pretty major roads from 35 to 25. And my car recognizes it like a hawk. Um, you know, so, so if you get behind a, a red model three that's driving like a grandpa at 25 miles an hour and everybody is zipping by at 40, um, it's because I'm using the software and the car is doing its thing. Yeah. Um, I, I do have the speed set to a threshold of like 10% over the speed limit, but on 25, that's only going like 28 and cars are still zooming by. Um, and you just, I kind of, you can ratchet it up with the, with the thumb wheel. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like uh, for us, uh, the autopilot doesn't allow you to go like on side streets, only five miles an hour over the speed limit. So I intend to not use it on the side streets just because it goes too slow. Um, but, but the way I've actually taken care of a lot of that, like if I'm going down to Ocean City, and I don't want to pay attention to the sign. I get behind another car and just follow the other car and it, you know, slowing down my car will slow down because it's slowing down and uh, stopping at a stoplight, same thing. So that was kind of my workaround when I didn't want to drive. <laughs> yep. People have asked me, you know, like how often I use it. And, you know, I, I do use it a lot, uh, like I said, because I feel compelled to, to you know, further the, the learning and, and the, um, yep. the betterment for the, for the society. But yep. it, in, part of me in the back of my mind is like it's a fun car to drive i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to be just like puttering along here well, um, I, but, I actually, but it's for science <laughs> yeah you know, and it's really good you're doing it I, I i was actually invited to the program but i didn't go to it because uh number one i don't drive enough right now to be contributing much uh and then the other was um that uh you have to turn off all the other third-party software you know, you can't allow that third-party software to access your, your system. And I use a lot of third-party software uh, just the yeah. status of what my car is doing and how it's doing and things like that. I have home, home automation, so it turns on and off lights based on how my car is doing. So uh, so I, I, I just wasn't ready to do that. So, but I'm glad right, you Like what, what JD is referring to is um, uh, the, the third-party apps. John, you, you talk about this in some of the yep. – um, the Owner, new owner programs, uh, Tesla Tap. Um, I forget what what the names are, but like even yeah, so, when I joined the beta program, you know that was one of the prerequisites. It's like you can't have any of these third party tools monitoring. So I, I wasn't using any to begin with, so it was pretty easy to give up. Well, one of my favorites is I actually have my home automation system. Uh, I have some status lights on, on my light switches. And I'm able to use one, like if I ever get below 50 miles range, it'll start flashing red and I'll know, hey, I, I, I'm in trouble. I better go out and plug my car in. And then I have other ones that tell me my car is plugged in or is charging and, and, uh, and what things like that. So it's just nice for me to have that. I didn't want to give it up. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Jake, John. It's missing uh, some yeah. zeros. <laughs> oh, I forgot my K. <laughs> 10 bucks everybody get it yep okay um anyway that's um that's the end of the slide deck for tonight i'm gonna so i'll close out we're gonna continue to answer any questions that you guys have um but uh, i'll close this out um uh just as a reminder if anybody on here is not uh, who lives in pennsylvania and is not a member of the test owners club this is where i have to do my plug um please make sure you get on the website and join us um, we have all kinds of great programs going on like this. Um, 
we also have uh, five local chapters right now in the state listed across the top there on the slide. Um, and uh, we're just getting ready for in-person events. Um, I think we've got a couple that are about to get scheduled and uh, um, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll all be able to see people in person. That's, that's a biggie for me. Hey, John, you realize our, um, that Ocean City event, we just realized the other day, uh, would, would have been uh, like three days ago, uh, one year ago. So <laughs> that, was, that was Ocean City meetup we had planned. Yep. For all the couple groups. I um, hope we get to do that. I'd like to still do that. Yep. Um, okay. So we're going to continue. Can we're going to continue answering any questions anybody might have. Um, I'm actually going to stop the recording. I think 